So um, during this event, um, we will hear from theoretical cosmologist Roberto Chotta about his book, The Edge of the Sky, which explains the universe using just a thousand simple words. From the Big Bang to black holes, from dark matter to dark energy, from the origins of the universe to its ultimate destiny, The Edge of the Sky tells the story of the most important discoveries and mysteries in modern cosmology with a twist. This book's lexicon is limited to the thousand most common words in the English language, excluding physics, energy, galaxy, or even universe. Through the eyes of a fictional scientist hunting for dark matter with one of the biggest telescopes on Earth, cosmologist Roberto Trotter explores the most important ideas about our universe in language simple enough for anyone to understand. A unique blend of literary experimentation and science popularization this delightful book is a perfect gift for any aspiring astronomer. The Edge of the Sky tells the story of a universe on a human scale and the result is out of this world. So Roberto is a professor of astrostatistics in the Astrophysics Group at Imperial College London, an academic fellow of the Data Science Institute at Imperial College London, and the director of Imperial's Centre for Languages, Culture and Communication. So if you have any questions for the event, please ask in the message chat down below and then we will answer these out for you at the end of the um, talk. So without further ado, I will pass on to Roberto. Thank you, Melanie. Hello, everybody. It's uh, great to talk to you all tonight for my computer, of course. It would have been much better to meet you all and see your eyes in person. And before this strange almost life that you cannot see made so many people sick and stopped all of us from hugging each other, this is the way it would have been. Still, thank you, Melanie and Louise, for having us all together to talk about the tongue of the stars. My name is Roberto Trotta, and I study uh, the tiny bits of matter that are all around us but that we cannot see, which we call dark matter. We know dark matter is out there because it changes the way other big, far away things move, such as stars and star crowds. We want to understand what dark matter is made of because it could tell us about where everything around us came from and what will happen next. To study dark matter, people like me use big things that have taken lots of money thought and people to build. Some of those things fly way above us. Some are deep inside the ground. Some are large rings that make tiny pieces of normal matter kiss each other as they fly around very, very fast, almost as fast as light. We hope that we can hear the whisper of dark matter if we listen very carefully. We take all the whispers from all the listening things and we put them together in our computers. We use big computers to do this as there are lots and lots of tiny whispers we need to look at. Tonight, I'd like to talk about a little idea, that it should be possible to speak about very hard things in a straightforward way that all people can understand. You see, the problem with student people like myself is that sometimes we get carried away and speak about our work using words in a tongue that only other student people can understand. A way to avoid all that is by talking with only the most used 10 hundred words in our tongue, like I'm doing now. When I heard about this, I thought that it could be fun to use it to explain the entire all the rings. Now, I've been in the UK for the best part of 15 years. And you know, when people heard about this idea of explaining the universe using only the most common thousand words in English, some of them were unimpressed that I only managed a thousand words in 15 years in the country. And they thought, you know, less than hundred words per year is not a great track record. And I would, I would agree with that. But the idea is that by giving ourselves constraints, which is a very popular and very effective, sometimes way of working in, in, in many art forms, by giving ourselves constraints, actually we free our creativity and fire up our, our imagination. And I wanted to try and find a way to do that for the entire universe, the all there is. But let me take us one step back in time 
to a picture of the universe that we all have in mind, perhaps. This idea of the universe with the Earth at its center, which of course has been with humankind from the dawn of time. And we have the Earth at the center of the universe and the seven spheres of the planets revolving around us, the, the, the sphere of the, of the stars, the fixed stars all around us. The universe was centered upon us. And that's a picture that it was compelling to our ancestors and was compelling for a simple reason that it encapsulates in many good ways what we see in the sky if we only pay attention to the night sky, something that nowadays we can't do anymore all that much because of the encroaching light pollution, unfortunately. But this picture was wrong, granted, but very compelling and it held sway for thousands of years until Copernicus and then Galileo came around and uh, they dethroned Earth from the center of the universe and put the sun at the center of the solar system and the heliocentric model took hold. We were no longer at the center of the universe, but, but, but one of the planets revolving around the sun. So that was over 400 years ago. And since then, the progress in astronomy, cosmology, the study of the universe has been immense. So much so that we are risking to lose touch with um, reality, in a sense, the way how do we explain those new ideas, the forefront of cosmology to everybody. Such an exciting field. So many people are so excited about the latest discoveries. How do we actually connect with uh, everyday experience? And the thing is that things have gotten more complicated and more difficult. And if your idea of astronomy, astrophysics, cosmology is this, a white middle-aged man, perhaps with a pipe, looking through a big telescope. This is Edwin Hubble in the 1950s. Well, this idea is now a little bit out of date, first of all, because it's not only white uh, middle-aged men that do the work today. Uh, we have increasingly many women in astronomy, which is great, not as many as we'd like. And we try to become a more diverse uh, group of people, which is very, very important. Here in this picture, you see Vera Rubin, one of the pioneers of dark matter astronomy, a picture in the 40s. But most importantly, because this idea that astronomy and the study of the universe is done like this, by peering through a telescope, is becoming very, very quickly, quite frankly, outdated. Cosmology, astronomy, astrophysics today are done like so, with billion dollar space observatories, uh, uh, large uh, ground-based facilities, including some uh, uh, that are deep into the Antarctic ice, like the Ice Cube uh, Neutrino Telescope. And all of these facilities create an avalanche of data that can only be understood. And uh, so all of this brings us to the point that astronomy and cosmology today is not done by telescope observations of the old style, but but rather by large data sets being collected and analyzed inside supercomputers. So big data, machine learning, AI is the frontier of astronomy. But the problem is that this becomes more and more removed from everyday experience. And how do we talk about this in an accessible, understandable, exciting way? So to give you a sense of cosmology and astrophysics, I put here the full moon to scale, which is an object we're all familiar with in the sky. And I want you to focus on this little yellow um, square, which not, looks nothing very exciting if you look at it with your naked eye. But actually, if you put on slightly more powerful eye, uh, glasses, if you like, that's to say the Hubble Space Telescope, this is what that little tiny square looks like. So that, this is a square that's so small that it would fit inside the eye of a needle held at arm's length. And inside that square, if you look at it with the Hubble Space Telescope, you see this, 5,500 galaxies inside the eye of a needle. So each one of those galaxies that you see in this amazing picture, it contains about 300 billion stars, like the sun. And so if you do the math, that tells you that there are about 50 billion galaxies in the observable universe alone. And that is the realm of cosmology. This is truly astronomical, truly mind-blowing, truly fascinating, and truly outside our everyday experience of the physical world around us. And so for people like me, whose research fundamentally uh, is about 
this kind of scales, this kind of domains, and whose interests are very much in the science communication side of things, the question becomes, how do we make sure that these exciting frontiers of science are accessible to everybody? Because this is research that concerns us all, firstly because it asks fundamental questions about the nature of reality, but also because it's done using money that's mostly uh, um, granted through um, taxpayers' money. So it's really, truly money invested for the benefit of humankind, fundamental research that needs to concern us all, and it addresses questions that we all have. Where did we come from? Why is the universe so big? Where is it going? What is it made of? How do we make sense of all of this in a way that doesn't hide behind jargon, doesn't hide behind complicated equations, and doesn't create the impression of an ivory tower of scientists, mad scientists, uh, hiding away in their academic offices. And sometimes, if you look at the research, it can feel a little bit like that. So this is a paper published in a special, spe specialized journal, the Astrophysical Journal, one of the most uh, important journals in my field, in 1999. And what it says, you know, it's, it's a little cryptic, to be honest. Measurements of omega and lambda from 42 high redshift supernovae. So the title doesn't really tell us much. But if we try to read the abstract, things become a little bit, actually, well, worse for the non-initiated. It says, the measurement yields a joint probability distribution of the cosmological parameters that is approximated by the relation 0.8 omega matter minus 0.6 omega lambda approximately equal minus 0.2 plus minus 1 in the region of interest, blah, 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 blah. We find that the data are strongly inconsistent with the lambda equals zero flat cosmology, the simplest inflationary universe model. What's it saying? I mean, this is incomprehensible and, you know, it's comprehensible to me because that's my speciality. But if I, if I gave it to another physicist in a different speciality, they would not understand it. It's so dense, it's so jargony, it's so complex, and it needs to be, because what this is saying, it's reporting of a discovery that a few years ago was awarded the Nobel Prize for Physics in 2011. But you wouldn't know by reading this article, and you can't, because this is aimed at the specialists. What this paper is saying is that the astronomers looked at 42 examples of such an explosion like in this artist's impression in the right-hand corner of the screen. Those are compact, dense stars called, uh, uh, called white dwarfs, which uh, are, uh, live in, with a companion star, in this case a red giant. You can see that the gravity of the small star is sucking in gas from the large star, until the pressure of the gas is so that a thermonuclear reaction is set off at the core of the white dwarf. And the white dwarf explodes in a huge, explosion that can uh, overshine an entire galaxy for a few days. And that explosion is so powerful that it can be seen from very far away in the universe. So astronomers look for this kind of rare explosions, there's one every, uh, every 100 years in a galaxy on average. The last one in our galaxy was in 1604. Uh, so we are over U1. So but if you can catch those explosions, then you've got a, a, a beacon of light in the universe and you can measure distances from, from you to the star exploding and to the galaxy in which the star uh, happens to reside. And that is a very powerful tool to tell what the universe has been doing in its, ex in its expansion. And what the astronomers discovered is that the distant galaxies were being expanded away from us much faster than they should have been. The universe was not slowing down in its expansion but was picking up speed, something that you cannot understand with the normal laws of gravity, including Einstein gravity, something that we now call the effect of dark energy, a strange new substance in intergalactic space that's repulsive and it's making the universe expand faster over time. Not something that would be easily discernible from the technical abstract that I just showed you. Now I wanted to uh, put you through this, the, the steps of becoming a, a supernova astronomer that's, that's how astronomers find the supernovae, the explosions. And so we take pictures of galaxies, or my colleagues take pictures of galaxies, and then we look for a bright dot that wasn't there before. 
So I'll invite you to scan the two pictures and spot the difference. There's one bright dot more in the right-hand side picture that's not in the left-hand side picture. And I invite you to spot it. That, that, that's the supernova explosion. So if you can measure that, then you've, you can measure the distance to the galaxy and you can pin down that edge. So this is all very well, and it's very exciting because it tells us something about the fundamental nature of the universe that we don't quite understand. But also, it gives us a challenge. How do we talk about this in a way that is understandable, in a way that will uh, sweep along uh, the public imagination and public support for this kind of fundamental research that is uh, very blue sky, uh, or in this case, dark sky, if you like, but very impor important. Um, there are many, many advances in the past that have come out of uh, very, uh, apparently very fundamental research that has then proved to be very applied. One example is the GPS signal that's inside your phone wouldn't work without Einstein's general relativity because of the time difference between us and the GPS satellites in orbit. So something fundamental about the nature of space-time is helping your GPS signal and Google Maps to work every single time you use it. So a very important application of fundamental research. So my challenge has always been over the many years where I've, I've tried to communicate and engage the, the public with my work, how to do so in a way that would be exciting, fresh, understandable, accessible as well. So I've experimented with various formats, a little bit outside the beaten track crap, so working with architects and artists, an example on the left-hand side here of a, of a prototype we developed for the Venice Architecture Biennale a few years ago, working with uh, artists, visual and, and, and um, uh, material artists to develop uh, ideas vaguely inspired or connected with foreground or, or forefront ideas, cutting edge ideas in, uh, in cosmology. And then more recently, I started using food as a source of inspiration. Food is something that we all, all love we are getting very much into food, uh, you know, during lockdown, as we all know, everybody was getting crazy with baking and so on. So food is something that concerns us all. So I try to find novel ways of using food as a metaphor for, in this case, the solar system with edible jellified spheres, cosmic cocktails, delicious and quite alcoholic, in fact. Praline, chocolate praline illustrated in different parts of the multiverse. And then I specialized in developing multisensorial uh, ways of engaging people with visual impairment, for example, people who have never seen the stars and therefore um, might be one step further removed from the kind of visual means of interacting with astronomy that we, that we usually have. So tactile methods, for example, and taste and texture and, and olfactory stimuli as a way of transforming the cosmos into a holistic, sensual experience. So this is, the, the, our current work in this field is together with the uh, group of Professor uh, Obrist in, uh, at, at, at uh, Sussex University, a computer human interaction experts lab. And we have developed a multi-sensory dark matter experience that, is, that uses the entire five senses. Uh, we've deployed it in a couple of, of, of festivals to, to to quite some, some interesting reactions from the public because we're trying to translate dark matter, which is by definition intangible, into a, a five-dimensional experience that you can experience and live with all your senses and not just visual uh, experience, but also olfactory uh, and, and, and haptic and taste. But all of this time, I was looking for something a little bit uh, different perhaps, a little bit more, uh, how should I put it, uh, condensed. And I once heard a story which is probably apocryphal, but it's too good to be, not to be true. So I, I'll tell you all the same, even knowing that probably this is not, at least the attribution of the story is an, is an urban myth. Nevertheless, it's a good story. And that was perhaps the starting point for the book. And the story is a story allegedly uh, around Ernest Hemingway, who was once apparently uh, over dinner challenged by his friends to come up with a story or rather with a novel in just six words. And so the story goes, Hemingway thought about it for a little while and then on a napkin he scribbled this. For sale, baby shoes, 
never worn, which is quite poignant, I think, and definitely um, very strongly uh, affecting as a story. And promptly, his friends uh, consider the bet because obviously this is a story which has got a beginning, a middle, and an end, and it's an affecting story. But what what uh, interested me about this was that in this format of flash fiction, six words for a story, something magic happens. You give just enough to your reader so that the reader can come up with their own version of what's actually happening. You got a, a way of stimulating people's imagination and firing up their own experience. They become part of the story. You have to fill in the gap, the gap in this story, just like Hemingway did, and every single story is different. Your story is different from mine. They all come from the same place, but they're all, they're all different and they're all participatory. It's not me telling you or, or anyway telling you the entire story, just enough to draw you in. And so my challenge was, is there something like that that could be useful and, and uh, to, to, to communicate science? And one day I found this, uh, a, uh, a picture of the um, Apollo 5 rocket on the XKCD website which is a website dedicated to uh, cartoons, often with a technical physics-y or computer science background, sometimes very technical, sometimes quite funny, by Randall Monroe. And Randall had this idea of labeling the Saturn V rocket with only the thousand most common words in English. And so he came up with this funny scheme, and, and it, it does do funny things. So the, 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 the rocket is no longer called the Apollo rocket, it's called the Upgoer 5 because it goes up and it's number five. It's no longer a rocket, it's a flying space car. And uh, you will find things like uh, the oxygen tank, which is called the cold air for burning and breathing. This part had a very big problem once. So it was a funny little idea. And I thought that it could perhaps be used to do what Hemingway did with this story. I mean, not, not comparing, of course, my writing with Hemingway's, far from it, but I was challenged to come up with a description of the entire universe and everything that uh, we've discovered and everything that we want to discover about the universe using the same format. And I thought, well, okay, I got a thousand words, you know, culled from the internet from somewhere. The pedigree is not very academic, to be honest, but that doesn't matter. The important thing is that we've got a thousand words, fairly common, all of them simple. Can we tell a story? about the universe, not a story, but the story, so far as we know it from science, about the universe. But the first problem was that I didn't have the word universe. I didn't have the word science or telescope or earth, moon, galaxy, big bang, particle, gravity. None of those words were on the list. And so I, I kind of almost gave up because I thought, well, actually, you can't really do it. You can't, you can't do that. Uh, but then little by little, actually, as I persevered, little by little, something interesting happened. And it's almost as if I learned this new language, this very restricted language, this very constraining language, but nevertheless a language. And so I started coming up with other words that were just as good or perhaps even better in some ways. Because you see, when I say galaxy as a physicist or as astrophysicist, I got all sorts of baggage coming with that word, which you know, my readers might not have. Your idea of galaxy will be different from mine. And so by using galaxy or electron or particle or any of the jargony words that I could use, actually, I, I'm thinking I'm being precise, but in reality, perhaps it's a false sense of security. Percival Lowell in 1906 put it quite succinctly and quite well. He said, technical phraseology, useful as shorthand to the cult, becomes meaningless jargon to the uninitiated and is paraded most by the least profound. And I'm with Lowell on this, absolutely. So why not simplify? Why not go to a language that's simple, accessible, and perhaps a little bit more poetic, one hopes. So universe becomes the older is, a telescope becomes a big seer, earth is your home world, galaxies are star crowds, uh, scientists are student people because we never stop uh, stop studying things. Uh, the Big Bang was, was a hard one. Initially, I came up with what I thought was a good description. You know, it's, it's a big explosion, if you like. It's very highly energetic. 
And so, uh, and it comes uh, in, in a very, very sudden moment. So I called it the hot flash. And then my editor said, no, you can't really call it the hot flash. And then, then I looked it up and did I discovered it was perhaps the best, the best way. And so I called it the big flash instead. And so one of those words then started coming in and just replacing um, the, the usual word and the book, The Edge of the Sky, is, is the result of, of that. And it's an attempt of explaining 10 short chapters, here it is, 10 short chapters, everything we've learned about the universe from you know, ancient times to today, explain it in simple language that everybody can understand, and in a way that perhaps unlocks a different, a different perspective on it all, a perspective that's less bogged down by technicality and perhaps tries to recapture the poetry, the fascination, the connection that we all have, or perhaps, you know, we'd like to have with the cosmos and the universe. So on that, I would like to take a short break and give you a challenge. And the challenge is to have you try the format. And so I've put together a, a, a box online that you can navigate to, I think Mel or, or Louise will put in the chat a link now. And I'm gonna take a five minutes break before coming back and concluding. And during these five minutes, I'd like to ask you to go to the website if you like, and give me your views of how does the night sky make you feel using only the most common thousand words. And uh, you might find it more challenging than you think, or you might find it that the format works just as fine for you. You might find it interesting or boring, difficult or easy. I'd like to ask you to spend five minutes uh, trying it out and uh, post the result in the chat if you like. If not, you can go off, take a, take a walk, have a cup of tea. And in five minutes from now, we'll reconvene at, say, 7.38, 7.39. We'll reconvene. I'll tell you a little bit more about the book. And uh, after that, of course, there's going to be a q and I look forward to your questions. And I look forward to hearing in the most common thousand words in English, how does the night sky make you feel? Five minutes. I'll see you in five minutes. Thank you for playing along. I look forward to hearing what you came up with. It's quite fun, at least to me, it's quite fun. So in the last few minutes before we, uh, we go to the q and I'd like to give you a, a little bit of a crash course in modern cosmology with a thousand words. Just a few select ideas that I found I find fascinating. You've been treated to a simulation of the dark matter universe uh, in, in, during the five minutes break. And I mentioned dark matter before, so perhaps it's worthwhile spending a little time understanding a bit more what dark matter might be. And first of all, how do we know it's out there in the first place? If, it, if it's dark, invisible, uh, undetectable so far, how do we know it exists? And one of the ways we know about dark matter is because of Einstein and his idea of space-time. And here is general relativity explained using only the most common thousand words. Mr. Einstein then said that space and time had to be married and form a new thing that he called space-time. Thanks to space-time, he found that time slows down if you fly almost as fast as light and that your arm appears shorter in the direction you're going. He then asked himself what would happen if you put some heavy stuff, as heavy as a star, in the middle of space-time. He was the first to understand that matter pulls in space-time and changes the way it looks. In turn, the form of space-time is what moves matter one way or another. So Einstein, differently from Newton, told us that gravity is not a force. Gravity is geometry. So if you put the sun at the center of space-time, space-time bends, like in this picture. There's a deformation and matter and light, they have to change their, their trajectory around that deformed space-time. Space-time changes its shape in response to the presence of matter. And so this happens, Einstein said, around the sun. And so if you have a light beam of a star coming through, 
it will be deflected from its straight path by, by the bent space-time, or more accurately, a straight path in a bent space-time is no longer a straight line. And so there's a difference in the apparent position of a star during a solar eclipse and its true position, which can be used to detect the presence of mass, in this case of the sun, and it was used in 1919 by Arthur Eddington to verify Einstein's prediction based on general relativity of this angle, this difference between the true and apparent position. And that's how we know that Einstein's gravity works and it's not Newton's gravity. And the same trick we can use on cosmological scale rather than looking at the bending of light due to the sun, we can look at the bending of light due to galaxies and clusters of galaxies. You can see this beautiful picture taken by the Hubble Space Telescope. A large amount of uh, arclets and um, almost rings around the central collection of yellow galaxies. What's happening here is that the space-time deformation that Einstein talked about are changing the trajectory of light as it travels through the universe. And the images of distant galaxies are distorted into the shape of rings and arclets. And from that, measurements we can, measurement we can reconstruct how much mass there is between us and the distant galaxies both visible and dark and that is one of the many lines of evidence that tells us that there's much more than meets the eye and indeed that there's about five times as much dark matter in the universe as visible matter so everything you see in this picture is visible matter but there's five times as much dark matter that we cannot see but whose space-time bending effect is brought forth by this uh, effect first predicted by Einstein in 1916. That's how we know about that matter. And indeed, the th things become even more crazy, if you like, because it's not just dark matter, it's also this dark energy that the stellar explosions told us about that in the book is called the dark push. So dark matter makes up 23% of the universe, but the dark energy, which is called dark push in the universe, makes up even more, 73% of the universe. It seems crazy that student people should think that there is a lot more stuff you can't see than stuff that you can see. Still, they do. In fact, they believe that there is about five times more dark matter than normal matter. If you look around us with a far seer, you will realize that the white road is made of many, many stars. There are about four times 10 stars in the white road for each person on our home world. And if you're using a big seer, you will find that there are as many other star crowds in the sky as there are stars in the white world. And yet, all of this is just a tiny bit of everything there is. And that is the frontier of astrophysics and cosmology. How do we understand this 95% of the all there is that is dark, invisible, and only barely detectable using this complex methods. That is the point I want to leave you at because that's also the point where our knowledge stops. The current knowledge is, is, is not vague, it's quite precise about what dark matter and dark, matter, dark energy could be, but we have no certainty and we have no confirmation of their existence except very strong hints. And very much one of the open questions in cosmology is how do we understand all of this dark universe? And so perhaps I want to conclude with a, the most, in my opinion, amazing thing of all. But perhaps the most amazing thing about the older is, is that we can understand it at all. Even though we still have lots of very big, very hard why questions. There are lots and lots of things we understand and can explain about everything around us. The older is speaks in a tongue the student people have learned to understand little by little. But there is still so much more left to tell. I'll leave you at that with this thought, and I look forward to hearing your views about the night sky and your questions. Thank you for joining us. Thank you so much, Roberto. That was absolutely amazing. Um, so we have the first question from someone who doesn't have a name, unfortunately. Um, does gravity travel with the speed of light? If not, why not? Great question. Um, Theoretically, it should, because gravity is transmitted via a massless uh, particle, the graviton, which therefore has to travel at the speed of light. 
And now, thanks to the detection of the black hole, black hole collision of a few years back, which gave a Nobel Prize for Physics uh, last year, if I'm not mistaken, we actually know that light and gravity travel almost exactly at the same speed. We've, we've been able to put a very strong limit on the difference in speed, and that difference is less than one part in a million billion. So if they're different, they're not very much different. Amazing. Um, I hope that answered your question. Um, so while we're waiting for some more questions, I thought I could read out some of the really beautiful responses oh, that people have had. Uh, so from Claudia, we are all under the same dark show with so many points of light. Love it. Nice. <clears throat> Very nice. Uh, from Nancy, quietly and calm, ready, surprise. Hi, Kustai. <laughs> um, from Lulu, silent, small, great, past sigh, tonight, last year, calm, evening, all night, maybe morning, eventually home, imagine life. And Jack said about the uh, thinking about the night sky, it makes me want to drink heavily or call the police on this weirdly scary and scarily weird sky. I can yes, understand that too. Absolutely. Beautiful. So Thank I'm you. really interested personally in um, the response of the people who have visual impairments with your work and how they. Um, what their response was like to learning more about the kind of distances in space. Are you able to talk a little bit more about that? Yes, I must say this is this is one of the experiences I've had that has been you know most most humbling and most affecting even on a personal level because uh, when we set off to, to to design this experience for people with visual impairment, we of course immediately understood that we needed to work closely with, with people from, from that community in order to, to create something that was genuine. And so we worked together with the RNIB to, to engage with, with people with visual impairment and to, to help to, so that they could help us create something that would, would be meaningful to them rather than to our perception of what it is like to be visually impaired if you haven't experienced that. And so we, we came up with a, with a workshop with various um, sensor, sensorial stimuli and, uh, and and also taste and, uh, and 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 olfactory stimuli that were all sort of designed to work together and give a, a sensorial impression of something for which uh, people with visual impairment often only had words. And the feedback was was, was quite affecting. And, and some people said that you know they they achieved a they achieved a level of, of if not understanding certainly of 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 of, um, of uh, connection with these ideas about the Big Bang and and galaxies in the, in the sky and uh, the presence of other parts of the universe. It was, in their words, um, life-changing. So this has been really, to me, this has been really, um, really, really important, important moment to show that if you, you know, if you want to be inclusive and you want to talk to people about your work, you have to come up with ideas and ways of doing so that go beyond the traditional one-way lecture and here are the facts. And you know, if, if you want the facts, take them. If you don't want them, this is science, and science is 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 right, etc. Yes, this works for some, but I think it's more important that science and astronomy and astrophysics speaks to people's hearts, not just to their minds. And so my my efforts have always been in this direction to make science a welcoming place, a welcoming tent, rather than something only for the initiated and something that it's only played on an academic intellectual level, which it is, of course. But you have to change, change tack, and change, and change game if you want to be more inclusive. We have really lots of great questions at the moment. So the next one is from John Evans, and he says, "If we ascribe a word matter to stuff that we don't know what it is, doesn't that create problems for our attempts in understanding, especially because we use instruments tuned for the matter we understand?" Great question, John. And uh, yes, it, it does color a little bit our perception of what it is, even subconsciously, perhaps. Having said that, dark matter and dark energy are a little bit of perhaps misnomers in some sense, but also they're just placeholders. They're just labels that we put on 
this thing that we don't really understand. Uh, and so, yes, we have to be careful, though, that if we call it matter, we don't uh, immediately blind ourselves to other possibilities. It could be, perhaps it could be black holes, perhaps it could be a different field of gravity, it could be a field, it could not be a particle at all, it could be a mistake in our data analysis and we're just uh, misunderstanding the data. Absolutely important. Um, I think, I think most people in the field recognize that dark matter is just a shortcut for all these observations and things that do not make sense in the normal paradigm of things and, 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 and act accordingly. But yes, we have to be watchful not to let it um, sort of prejudge and color our investigations, absolutely. So we've got the next question from Finn Evans. When we see light from the earliest galaxies at the edge of the observable universe, are photons from that far away really hitting the telescope, having travelled that far? It seems unbelievable that the tiny particles have actually been travelling that long but still work together to create a cohesive picture. Yeah, indeed, yes. If you stop and think about it, particles, photons travelling billions of light years through the universe, uh, arriving, you know, to to you know, to, to our telescopes, or or if you look at the Andromeda galaxy, which you can see with your naked eye, or through a, a small telescope, you know, those are photons that have left 2.5 million years ago, before Homo sapiens even existed on this planet. So absolutely mesmerizing timescales. One thing that that's fun, uh, Finn, is also and not perhaps widely known, is that some of those photons, in fact come from a place, not the Andromeda ones, but the ones that you mentioned from you know, very far away, uh, they come from a place that's expanding currently at faster than light speed uh, velocity. And, and you know, the universe is expanding, and so uh, galaxies move away from us, we move away from them, and uh, the further away you go, the faster the universe expands. Now, people think, oh, well, surely it cannot exceed the speed of light because that's the limit. Einstein told us so, and that's true, except this limit only applies within space. If space itself expands, then the speed of light limit no longer applies, and those photons come from a galaxy that has been expanding away forever, or since, or rather, since that photon left at faster than the speed of light. And then, of course, the paradox is to understand how can this, the photon catch up with us if it's going faster than the speed of light, if it's a trans faster than the light. That's a little more complicated to explain but it's an interesting sort of trivia fact if you want to use it in a pub quiz or something. So the next question is from someone um, who hasn't put their name on and it says, is there dark matter on Earth? Could we theoretically make objects out of it? There is dark matter on Earth. I've got a picture of it here from the book. That's not a literal picture, of course, but it's just to say that right now, if you put out your hand or even if you don't, there are about 16 million dark matter particles per second, we believe, if our theories are correct, going through your hand right now. In, 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 in this room, wherever you are, there is, a, there is a density of dark matter going, a stream of dark matter going through it. Um, going back to the previous question, that is one of the assumptions, of the theoretical assumptions, that drives some of the efforts to, um, to build detectors to see these dark matter particles. If the theory is wrong, then of course the detectors won't see anything. Uh, but that's, that's a good thing, because if you build a detector to see dark matter, you don't see it according to a, a prediction of a theory, then you can cross out that theory and you move on. So this is how science works, we're testing hypotheses. To your second, the second part of your question, can we build something out of it? Uh, very hard, I mean, it's not inconceivable, but again, according to some theoretical models, dark matter only interacts uh, by gra gravity, or the weak force. Now the weak force, as the name suggests, is extremely weak. So you wouldn't be able to, to build like, you know, a ball of dark matter because a ball, in, in, in a normal ball is held together by electromagnetic forces, which the dark matter doesn't feel. So in principle, while it is not inconceivable that you could manipulate dark matter through gravity or the weak force, in practice, this is not something that we can conceive how to do. Um, it would take a very advanced civilization to work this out. And it would be very, very hard to, to condense the dark matter sufficiently to work with it in the first place, because you wouldn't be able, you know, if you think about it, dark matter is precisely so difficult to detect because it traverses Earth 
without feeling anything. So you can't catch it. Literally, you can't hold it. And so to build a dark matter um, net, if you like, is, is, is not physically impossible, but it's technologically almost inconceivable. <clears throat> okay, amazing, thank you. The next question from Claire Humphreys. Is it possible to explain a black hole using the same 1,000 words? A black hole? I think I have a description of a black hole somewhere in the book. Um, yes, definitely. I think I, I, I talk about Hawking and, and the black hole uh, and the light um, coming out. But the, the fact is that um, what I found is that after you get the hang of it, if you experiment it with, experiment with it a little bit more, then the 1,000 words become sufficient for quite a lot. And um, in the end of the day, I only use 707 of the thousand words list. And black hole um, was def is definitely in the book somewhere. So yes, it is possible. I can't find it in, in, in a second, but it's in there. And the book is available online. So it's a, it's a nice little gift. It's not very expensive at all. So I'm just saying. <laughs> Okay, so we have another question um, and also a comment. So this is from Claudia and she says, Ciao Roberto, I totally agree with what you said that fixing a specific form unleashes your creativity in unexpected directions. I'm really curious about the technique you used in the book. How did your practice to really get into it? Did it change your other writing or your way of thought? It did. Ciao Claudia, thank you for uh, the great question. No, it did, you're right. Um, at the beginning it was hard, it was very hard. And uh, as a scientist, you know, used to academic style of writing, it's, it's quite a shift of perspective, I, I will admit. But it changed me in, in two ways. First, I realized it was just another language. You know, I'm, obviously English is not my mother tongue, uh, Italian is, I speak French and German, none of those languages very well. But so I'm used to the idea of transitioning from a language to another. I'm used to the idea also that your personality and the way you express yourself changes in different languages. And I'm sure, I'm sure you, you feel the same if you speak multiple languages. And so after fashion, I, I started to think of this as a different language. And I started to think in that language, and then I started to type directly in, in a way that just worked. You know, I, I found myself using fewer and fewer of the forbidden words because I started to feel the boundaries of... Of, of my linguistic space. So that changed me because it, it made me realize that all of the gloss and all of the detail, all of the jargon we put on things, because we, we're striving for precision, we're striving for accuracy as scientists, this is all irrelevant. This is all irrelevant for the purposes of, of science communication. Don't get me wrong, it's fundamental for science, of course, but if you want to connect with others outside your field, What's important is to excite them. What's important is to draw the, the beam. The beam. What's important is to tell a story, a story that people will, will, will feel part of. And that is what this language did for me. And so it, it really changed my way of writing. Now I'm writing, a, I'm working on a new book with all the words I want, uh, which is <laughs> very strange. But uh, I, I think about, about this all the time as I write this new book. I am uh, I'm very mindful that you know, words are powerful and the story that emerges um, can, can dispense with a lot of the detail because that's not the point. You know, information is on your fingertips. You can always Google something if you want to know more. But to find a good way of telling an interesting story, one that makes you feel part of it, that's, that's my challenge. So along the same lines, Tim Powell wonders if you would like to read some of your favorite descriptions from the book. So if you need a bit of time to think about that, you could maybe do that at the end if you like. Sure, yes, yes, with pleasure. Thank you. Okay, great. So I'll ask the following question from Mark New. Um, has the clearer night sky due to less light pollution under COVID-19 allowed you to see further into the universe? Thank you, Mark. That's a great question. Um, well, as, as in, <laughs> that's, that's a great question because in fact, uh, tonight, if the the good weather holds. I'm going to go out to Wimbledon Common uh, precisely for that purpose. I need to count the stars uh, and, and see whether they're any different than before. I think that it probably will be a bit better, less haze out there. So that's good. Uh, so in terms of, of clear skies, yes, less haze, less pollution, less contrails, 
which are the, the, you know, the, 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 the trails left by aviation, they generate more uh, high level clouds that make seeing the sky even more difficult, you know, uh, uh, light pollution notwithstanding. So yes, scientifically, no, because most of our telescopes are anyhow in very clean skies, and deserts, high altitude deserts or in space. The one big problem though that we are facing in those days, and you might have heard about it in the news, both as astronomers, professionals and amateurs, is this uh, constellation of GPS satellites that's being sent uh, to space by the likes of Elon Musk and Jeff Bezos. And those satellites are now essentially polluting our view of the night sky because they're so numerous, so reflecting that, you know, if you go out with a small telescope or even with binoculars, you will see them essentially um, shooting through the sky and it's impossible to miss them because there are hundreds, thousands of them and they reflect back the sunlight. And so they essentially pollute our view of the sky so much so that they ruin professional astronomers' view of the sky because they streak through their images and they ruin their observations. But perhaps most importantly, in my opinion, almost, not quite, I mean, it's equally important, they ruin our view of the pristine sky. You know, I'm in London right now. If I want to have clear dark skies, I have to travel by car a couple of hours in the South Down Natural Dark Sky Reserves. I find pretty good dark skies, not the perfect sky, but pretty good skies where I can see the Milky Way. And I can connect back to that sky that way. But now with this constellation of satellites, you know, they circle the Earth every 90 minutes. There's thousands of them. There is no place on the surface of the Earth where you can escape them. So our view of the sky, a view that stretches back to the dawn of civilization and before, is now disappearing. And that to me is a great concern, an environmental concern, a cultural concern, and a professional concern. So we have another question from Finn Evans. If galaxies are moving away from each other because space itself is expanding, does this also apply to smaller structures and should we be worried that we'll all start expanding too? <laughs> great question. I mean, if my office was expanding, that'd be good. So I would have more space for books and, and my chaos, which is always threatening to engulf me. But unfortunately, that is not so because uh, here on Earth, Earth does not expand, the solar system does not expand, the galaxy does not expand, or even the distance between us and Andromeda does not expand because all of these structures are held together by gravity. So the local gravity here is much, 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 much bigger, uh, a factor 10 to the 30 times bigger than the gravity between intergalactic points. And that means that here, the expansion of cosmological scales is hindered, is prevented from happening by the local gravity of the Earth, of the Sun, of the galaxy, which is much, much stronger. So this phenomenon of, of galactic, oh, sorry, of cosmological expansion is very much limited to the intergalactic space between very distant points in the universe and does not happen on, uh, on even solar system or even galactic scales because the local gravity prevents it from happening. Uh, we've also got another question from Claire. The gastronomy project is fascinating. What are some of the scents and tastes you use to give your audience an idea about dark matter? Yes, so, so we picked dark matter precisely for the reason that, you know, it's conventionally invisible, impossible to feel, and we wanted the challenge of translating it into something tangible. And so you can, you can watch a, small, a short video on, from my website if, if you want to sort of know more about it. Uh, but in a nutshell, what we did, we created a, an immersive experience in a planetarium dome, an inflatable dome, which was usually designed for 10, 15 people, but we made it for two people at the time because we wanted to create this enclosed dark structure you could enter and find yourself surrounded by the dark matter simulation that you saw earlier. And then you'd find bean bags with fluorescent outlines on the floor. You, you plop down on those. There is a, a mysterious looking box which hides a haptic transducer, which is essentially an ultrasound powered device that will make you feel mid-air haptic sensations on your hand. So you get stimuli, the dark matter wind is materialized on your hand uh, in this almost magic way, if I may say so. Of course, it's, you know, it's ultrasounds, but Nevertheless, it feels magic if you try it because you don't know what it is. And then you'll have immersive wireless headphones with 
and the dark matter wind in, in it, and a narrative that will take you on a tour of the galaxy and the dark matter galaxy. And I think perhaps the most we had uh, olfactory stimuli that were designed to um, stimulate your sense of strangeness and perhaps empty space or uh, or distant uh, space. And the fun bit was the dark matter pill that we designed, which was designed to dissolve on your tongue and give you a crackling sound all around your skull. And that was another perception of how dark matter might feel like if, you, if your tongue would become a dark matter detector, which is again impossible, but it was a fun way and people just, just loved it. <laughs> we have another question from Nigel Martin. He says, if there are 60 million dark matter particles per second passing through our hand, then we presumably have an idea what the mass is of a single particle. What is it? Correct. And indeed, we have an idea, but we don't have a number. So that 60 million number I gave you actually makes a very specific assumption on what the dark matter mass ought to be. And in fact, if you change that mass, then the number, the 60 million number can change accordingly, higher or smaller. So I've given you a very biased number, uh, not biased, but a very specific number, making a very specific assumption of the kind that John earlier was mentioning. Uh, so that mass that I've used in this calculation is the mass that corresponds to 100 times the mass of a proton. So what we do know, or rather what we do suspect, is that the dark matter mass probably, according to some theoretical framework, ought to be much larger than the mass of normal matter for theoretical reasons. Although there are other theories as well that are that, that predict ultralight dark matter at the other end of the spectrum. So it's, it's really a mixed bag. You know, all, anything that you say uh, is conditional on making some assumptions over which you know, we have no definite answer. So, but we make assumptions, we look for those things. If we can't find them, then we cross out the assumption, we move on to the next. That's the way science, science works. It deals with uncertainty by crossing out the wrong answers and hopefully eliminating the wrong ones to zoom into the truth. So I have another question from Nigel, which was sent a little bit earlier. What is the percentage of the yellow slice in your pie chart, the amount of matter that is giving out light? Question mark. Oh, that's a, that's a very small percentage, depending exactly how you count, but it's about 0.3% uh, or less. So it's a very, very small percentage. Most of the normal matter in the universe is, uh, is, is, um, doesn't emit visible light. It's in the form of interstellar intergalactic gas that doesn't emit in the visible part of the spectrum. We know about, that, about this from other observations, including X-rays for hot gas and, and radio observations. Uh, but essentially the stars and the galaxies that we see is 0.3% of the total, so really a tiny, tiny fraction. Um, we also have a follow-up from Finn who asked um, if galaxies are moving away from each other because space itself is expanding. Finn asked, but isn't dark matter much bigger and stronger than gravity? Isn't dark matter much bigger and stronger? Is that the question? Yeah. Yeah, I mean, dark matter, again, if it is this kind of particles that we've been discussing and it's massive, then it will emit gravity and that gravity will contribute to slowing down the expansion of the universe. And so Sorry. it would slow, slow down the expansion of the galaxies. However, the key is how much dark matter is there and how strong is this effect? Now, remember I said 25% of the universe is dark matter that statement you know, needs to be qualified because if the universe is, is infinite, as our data seem to indicate, then 25% of infinite is still infinite. So I should probably be more specific and say 25% of the observable universe, or rather 25% of the density of the universe, which is one of the prime quantity. But you know, this 25% is expressed in units such that if the total amount of matter, both visible and dark, is larger than one, larger than 100% of whatever units, that means that the attraction of gravity is sufficiently strong for the universe's expansion eventually to stop and turn around and recollapse into a big crunch. But if it's less than 100%, then the universe's expansion will keep going because the strength of gravity produced by dark matter and visible matter together combined is insufficient to slow it down. To, to stop it from expanding. On top of that, we've got dark energy, the dark push, which is actually pushing things away further, and it's actually dominating, is the most important component. 
So it's in principle, you're right. Dark matter, if there was enough dark matter, it would stop the universe from expanding and it would make you recollapse in a big crunch in the future. But apparently this is not the case. There isn't enough dark matter to do that. Lisa Pettibone asks, since we are matter, does our matter just start the space around another human? Sorry, Mel, can you repeat that? It does matter? Distort the space around another human. Well, in principle, well, yes, in principle, the matter that we are made of, being uh, massive, uh, will have a tiny, tiny distortion effect on on space around us. So, we are, you know, the, the, the dimple in space time that I showed by from the sun is, in principle, you know, applicable to anything made of matter or even any piece of energy, even light does the same. Uh, but the effect is infinitesimal. You couldn't dream of measuring it. It's, it's, it's so, so small because the mass of our body is so, so tiny compared to the mass of the earth or the, the sun. And so, yes, in principle, yes, we, we do distort space-time as we walk around. We all carry with us those little space-time distortion bubble, if you like. But it's so, so tiny that, that it's, um, um, it's inconceivable that you could ever be able to measure it. You could calculate what it is, and, but it would be really, really small. Okay, we've got one question from Rosamond Martin. How do you decide how to represent these things that you represented in the gastronomic total experience? Considering that it is a poetic interpretation, am I right in thinking that the real total experience for a human in the environment you are simulating, whether that human is sighted or not, would be some kind of immediate death? <laughs> Well, you're right that it's a poetic experience and it's, it's presented as such. So we, you know, we make it very clear that this is a, an experience that's based and inspired and builds on many layers of science, uh, but it is not scientific. You know, we, you know, this is very clear that this is, this is tongue in cheek for, 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 for a good uh, for, for reason, for all the reasons that I explained. I think people are, are okay with that. And also during the experience before and after the experience, we sandwich it with some hard fact science so that we hopefully have an holistic experience that's poetic at its core, memorable, engaging, but also comes with information and science attached. So people, you know, they don't just come off, come away with a nice, nice feeling, but also come away with some new curiosity and information about that matter itself. Um, having said that, we design, so we designed it with, with, with these parameters in mind, based on the science and, and inspired by the science, but then playful, engaging, interesting. Uh, when I work with chefs, of course, chefs always wanted their creations to taste good because it doesn't matter, you know, you, you, don't want, you, can, you can design perhaps interesting dishes and we tried, but you know, we wanted to do one only made with the microwave to connect with the microwave universe at the beginning of time. But the chef just vetoed it because they felt, you know, this doesn't taste good. <laughs> I'm not going to serve this. So, right, there are, there are you know, you have to make compromises, but, uh, but I think in all art and science collaborations that I've been involved in, the successful ones, not all that have been successful, I think, to me, the challenge has always been to find that happy in-between space between art and science or gastronomy and science or multisensorial uh, studies and science, um, which is not an artistic representation of my science because I'm not interested in that, it, which is not me putting a scientific gloss on some on an artist's creation because yeah I can do that but it's not interesting is finding that space in between the real um, cross disciplinary space that doesn't exist unless both sides come together creatively and openly and, and create something genuinely new that is neither one nor the other as of for the death experience maybe um, I don't think that would be go down well with our health and safety people necessarily so probably probably not although. The dark matter multisensorial experience does end with the spaghettification in the central black hole. So perhaps we, we, we did hint at the ultimate death uh, experience a little bit, actually. Okay, that's now the last question. Um, so, Roberto, would you mind reading from your book? No, with great pleasure. Um, great pleasure. Maybe I'll, I'll read. It's, it's fitting, perhaps, to read from the last the last page or two of the 
the last, the last chapter, indeed, it's just two pages long of the book. I think it might be a good, a good way of, of finishing this, this, this encounter and thanking you all for, for coming and for uh, your questions and for your beautiful expressions of the night sky. And so, uh, just to give you a sense, maybe I have it here, do I? Yes. So, the, uh, the book, illustrated by a, a talented artist, Antoine de Pre, uh, who made these illustrations for me. So, the book follows the, uh, the, the journey, uh, the fictional journey of a, of a, of a science, of a, of a student woman, uh, that's to say, a female scientist who goes out to a big seer a telescope to investigate dark matter. And so, through her eyes, we talk about uh, dark matter, dark energy, um, what we know about the universe, the multiverse, etc. And so it ends by probably not giving away anything <laughs> to uh, you know sort of an anticlimax. If I give away the ending, it ends with the end of the night when the, 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 the scientist, the woman, has finished her observations and uh, reflects in this way. She sits down. The big blue body of water in front of her seems to go on without edges and without end. She can feel the warm hand of the sun on her face. She feels happy. The night's work has gone well. Big Seer has done a great job, the best that could be done. She can go home now. But her job has only just begun. There is much more left to do in the coming weeks and months before she can make sense of what Big Seer saw last night. She's looking forward to it. Letters and words and entire books are hidden in what Big Seer has given her, written in a strange tongue of the old there is. Little by little, she will understand it better and better. All she needs to do is ask the right questions in the right way, and she might learn the truth. She smiles, and the sun smiles back at her.